Good afternoon, everybody. Before I begin, I would like to say this. The ranks of our Justice Department and FBI are filled with amazing, patriotic men and women who passionately love their jobs and our country. They take their oath seriously and perform their jobs exceptionally. They enforce our rule of law and make us proud each and every day in the performance of their duties. It is deeply unfortunate that individuals at the highest levels of these legendary historic agencies weaponized their powers and acted highly improperly. Their misconduct is a reflection on them, not on everyone else performing their responsibilities to the very best of their abilities and making everyone in our nation so proud of them each and every day. In May of this year, 19 members of Congress introduced a 12-page House resolution detailing misconduct at the highest levels of the DOJ and FBI with regards to FISA abuse, how and why the Hillary Clinton email probe ended, and how and why the Donald Trump Russia probe began. This resolution also called for the appointment of a second special counsel to investigate this gross misconduct with the understanding that the Justice Department cannot be expected to investigate itself. 33 members of the House now sponsor this resolution calling for the appointment of a second special counsel because we and our constituents want transparency and accountability. And yet since the introduction of this resolution, further evidence has come to light of misconduct at the highest levels of the DOJ and FBI. The same principles that motivated us to introduce our resolution then are driving us with even more determination and resolve today. I'm joined here today by several of my colleagues, including Congressman Meadows, Jordan Gates, and others, to call on the President of the United States, Donald Trump, to declassify and release important information for the American public. As I stated in my tweet yesterday, quote, powers were abused, the FISA court was misled, and we have zero tolerance for any of it. There are three parts to our request. One, we are calling for the declassification and release of the Carter Page FISA applications. While we are strongly in favor of releasing the entirety of the FISA applications, except for the necessary redaction of any sources and methods that must truly remain classified, we most specifically want to ensure that the President declassifies and releases 20 pages in particular of the last FISA renewal. This includes pages 10 to 12, and 17 to 34, along with the associated footnotes. We are confident that the FISA applications will prove that the highest levels of the DOJ and FBI failed to provide the FISA court with critically important information when they requested a warrant to spy on Carter Page and others. Part two of our request is that we are calling on the president to declassify and release all 12 of the Bruce Orr 302s. We are confident that these 302s contain critically important information that should have been provided to the FISA court, but wasn't. Part three, we're also calling for the declassification and release of the documents provided to the Gang of Eight that contain exculpatory evidence regarding Carter Page and others. We are confident that these documents also contain critically important information that should have been provided to the FISA court, but wasn't. In October 2016, the FBI and DOJ used politically biased, unverified sources to obtain a warrant from the FISA court to surveil a U.S. citizen, Carter Page. The warrant, along with three renewals, also would have enabled investigators to access Page's communications with other Americans, including other Trump campaign associates. The warrants grant U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies sweeping power to collect bulk information and conduct a ballot collection, which results in surveillance of a broad array of private communications from the past, present, and future, including those of U.S. citizens not specifically targeted in the FISA authorized warrant. To obtain these warrants, FISA and DOJ officials submitted an unverified dossier prepared by Christopher Steele to the FISA court. The officials failed to disclose that Christopher Steele was hired by the firm Fusion GPS, which was hired by the Democratic National Committee and Hillary Clinton campaign to prepare this dossier, and that the source was unreliable and was soon thereafter going to be terminated as a source. The FISA court was not informed that Christopher Steele was actively opposed to the election of Donald Trump, that he was the unnamed source cited in the media reports that the FBI used to corroborate his dossier, and that Fusion GPS had been hired to perform previous anti-Trump research efforts in 2015. The Woods procedures, which are the FBI's mandatory vetting process required for all FISA warrant applications instituted to ensure that all the facts contained in the application are accurate 
and verified to clearly support probable cause for a warrant were not followed. Former Director Comey admitted in sworn testimony to the Senate Judiciary Committee on June 8, 2017 that material contained in the Steele dossier was known to be both salacious and unverified. Since FISA warrant applications are rarely turned down, are almost never subject to appeal, and are presented in closed court with no public record where the government is not challenged by any defense, it is imperative that the government take extra care to validate the information being utilized to build their case before they take the extraordinary step of waiving rights of a U.S. citizen without his or her knowledge or the opportunity to present a defense. At the FISA court, the government has a responsibility not only to provide its best evidence in support of its application, but also the best evidence it has against its case. In this case, the DOJ failed to do so. There apparently was very important exculpatory evidence that was provided to the Gang of Eight that was not even presented to the FISA court. These deeply flawed and questionable FISA warrant applications utilizing illicit sources and politically biased intelligence were approved by DOJ and officials and, and FBI officials at the highest levels before being presented to the FISA court. It was further hidden from the FISA court that Nellie Orr, the wife of the fourth highest ranking DOJ official, Bruce Orr, worked for Fusion GPS. The court also wasn't notified that even after Steele was terminated as a source by the FBI for leaking information to the press, the FBI continued to effectively use him as a source via Steele's contacts with Bruce Orr. Despite the troubling fact that he was terminated as a source by the FBI for leaking information to the press and for other reasons, the FBI continued to use him through Bruce Orr. Christopher Steele directly transmitted the dossier and other information through Bruce Orr to the FBI, which then submitted allegations from the dossier to the FISA court. The details of the interviews between the FBI and Orr are laid out in a series of 302s written by the FBI, but the DOJ continues to improperly keep those 302s as classified. In February 2018, the President of the United States declassified information within a memorandum by the House Intelligence <coughs> Committee, which revealed that, before, quote, before and after Steele was terminated as a source, he maintained contact with DOJ via then Associate Deputy Attorney General Bruce Orr, a senior DOJ official who worked closely with Deputy Attorney Generals Yates and Rosenstein. Shortly after the election, the FBI began interviewing Orr, documenting his communications with Steele. For example, in September 2016, Steele admitted to Orr his feeling against then-candidate Donald Trump when Steele said he was desperate that Donald Trump not get elected and was passionate about him not being president, end quote. Later that month, in response to a request by Senators Grassley and Graham, the DOJ declassified a letter that referred to the Bruce Orr 302 interview summary stating that, quote, numerous FD302s demonstrating that DOJ official Bruce Orr continued to, pa to pass along allegations from Mr. Steele to the FBI after the FBI suspended its formal relationship with Mr. Steele for unauthorized contact with the media and demonstrating that Mr. Orr otherwise funneled al allegations from Fusion GPS and Mr. Steele to the FBI, end quote. In May of 2018, upon request, the DOJ produced 63 pages of unclassified emails and notes documenting Mr. Orr's interactions with Mr. Steele on these issues. The 302s contain Mr. Orr's recounting of his interactions with Mr. Steele, which are unclassified. The dates of Mr. Orr's interviews with the FBI to relay information, which have already been declassified. And Mr. Orr's emails and notes documenting their interactions, which also are not classified yet the 302s themselves remain classified. As Senator Grassley has stated, quote, nothing about these documents ought to be marked classified, end quote, we agree. As, a, as I stated earlier, we are confident that important information in these 302s that should have been provided to the FISA court were not actually provided to the judges as it should have been. The same applies to important information contained in the documents provided to the Gang of Eight. We believe in equal scales of justice, that no one is above the law. That includes anyone regardless of last name, and that even includes people at the highest levels of the DOJ and FBI, especially when misconduct is committed in the performance of their duties while trying to take down elected officials and candidates. As representatives, it is our constitutional duty to ensure that our constituents, the American people, know the truth, that they possess the information they have every right to possess, and that those officials who abuse their powers and misled the FISA court to obtain a warrant to spy on Americans are held accountable. The numerous severe irregularities involved in this investigation, the very notion of an administration employing our nation's counterintelligence capabilities to investigate its political opponents during a political campaign 
have deeply shaken Americans' confidence in the leadership of U.S. intelligence and law enforcement agencies. These agencies exist to protect Americans from foreign threats, not to try to sway the outcome of our elections or to destabilize a duly elected administration. In conclusion, the continued attempts to hide from the public a full accounting of these abuses is intolerable. The American people have a right to know exactly what happened in this investigation so we can implement reforms to ensure that such abuses are never repeated. We will not allow those responsible for these misdeeds to improperly cite national, national security concerns to keep the truth from coming to light. The only satisf satisfactory outcome now is full transparency for the American public and full accountability for those who maliciously <coughs> subjected American citizens to surveillance abuses. Mr. President, there are members of Congress and millions of Americans asking for you to declassify and release this information. We want the truth. We here, standing here today, are all members of Congress that have a zero tolerance for those who abuse their powers and for all of the misdeeds and misleading of the FISA court in trying to secure a FISA warrant to spy on American citizens and the Trump campaign. At this time, I would like to introduce Congressman Mark Meadows. Lee, thank you for your leadership. Obviously, this comes down to time and transparency. It is time that we have transparency. We, we're two years into an investigation that quite frankly has produced no results uh, as it relates to collusion between the Trump campaign and uh, uh, Russian interference. Uh, I can tell you that what uh, the American people, my district wants, is they want transparency and they want it now. Uh, I think all of the members as Lee has articulated, when we returned home during August, they said, why not just declassify the documents while protecting the sources and methods and make sure that what we do is we allow the American people to judge for themselves. There have been allegations of improper collection of information on the part of the FBI. I'm here to tell you today that there is more than a reasonable doubt that those allegations are true. So let's declassify the documents, let's make sure the American people can judge for themselves. And I think at the end of the day, uh, an administration that wants transparency, a president who has time and time again said, let's be transparent, we have nothing to hide. Mr. President, we're calling on you today to encourage those around you to go ahead and release those documents and release those documents within the next week. Uh, we thank you. I thank Lee for your leadership, and I'm going to introduce uh, Jim Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Lee, thank you for your leadership. Uh, look, the reason we're calling for this now is in light of uh, the things, key things we learned last week uh, from Mr. Orr's deposition. Um, we think that's the catalyst and the reason that it's time to come clean. We know the FBI and the DOJ aren't going to do it, so we're asking the President of the United States to make this information uh, available to the American people so we can once and for all figure out exactly uh, the wrongdoing that, that took place. But last week we learned a couple key things, and Lee went through this, but just to reiterate, the dossier was the key to all this, uh, and the FBI knew everything, everything before they went to the court to get a warrant to spy on a fellow American citizen and then to spy on the Trump campaign. They knew who paid for the document, they didn't tell the court that, they knew the Orr's involvement, both Bruce and Nellie's involvement in producing that document, they didn't tell the court that, and they didn't tell the court the statement that Mr. Zeldin read, that, that Christopher Steele had told Bruce Orr, and Bruce Orr had told the key people at the FBI that Chris Steele, the author of the document, was desperate to stop Trump from being elected. Those are pretty darn important facts that they did not convey to the court. The other thing we learned last week as well is that the key people all knew. Andy McCabe knew, Lisa Page knew, Peter Strzok knew, and Andrew Wiseman at DOJ knew as well. So that's important information that, again, I think the American people need to see these documents, see this information so they can look at it and evaluate for themselves. The other key fact is this, Orr and Steele continued to meet as Mr. Zeldin talked about. Even after the FBI fires the guy who wrote the document, who wrote the key document that was the basis for all of it, the dossier, they continue to meet, they continue to have conversations, and there are all these 302s that we want to see, and more importantly, the American people deserve to see. Not only did those continue after Steele was fired, these meetings and these interactions and the 302s from then. It also continued after Bob Mueller's special counsel was named. No one has seen those 302s. No one has seen those. 
we want to, we want those made available as well. And then finally, the other key takeaway I think from last week was, um, why did Fusion and Chris Steele need Bruce Orr at all? Chris Steele had a direct line to the FBI. Why do you have to run information through Bruce Orr? He could just give this information straight to the FBI. I mean, I asked Bruce Orr about this. Why did why did they need why did they need you? And it seems to me the reason was all this this circular pattern that existed that gives weight to a document that we all know now was not true, this dossier. If you got a top Justice Department official also passing information to the FBI, also talking about it, maybe even communicating this to the press or via him or they can talk to the press about Bruce Orr's involvement, that gives weight to this to this document that we know wasn't accurate, wasn't true at all. So uh, I think that's a key point. For all those reasons, these three things need to be made public. That's why we're calling for it to happen, and we hope that it happens, as Mr. Meadows said, sooner rather than later. Mr. President, we need your help. Each and every member of Congress here has made some contribution to uncovering the bias and corruption that we've seen at the highest levels of the Department of Justice and the FBI. But we will be limited in our tools to conduct effective oversight in the absence of the documents that we are requesting today. They have to be declassified, Mr. President, so that we can lay out for the Congress and for the American people the rotten basis for the investigations that continue solely to delegitimize the duly elected President of the United States. I appreciate Mr. Zeldin, Mr. Jordan, Mr. Meadows for assisting in this effort. And it's, it's my suspicion that the most important information in the documents we're seeking to be declassified won't be what's in those documents, but what is left out of them. You will not see in the FISA application any indication that Bruce Orr was functionally the handler for Christopher Steele while his very own spouse was getting paid with money that could be traced back to the Democratic Party and the Clinton campaign. I don't suspect that we'll see in the FISA application the very, uh, the very origins of the collusion that existed between Christopher Steele and elements uh, of, of the Russian Federation that were trying to pollute a Trump presidency. And I certainly don't think you will see the bias that was laid out from people moving from the Clinton campaign to the FBI uh, investigation of the president and his campaign, and then on to the special counsel's investigation. So uh, we may see more in the omissions than in what is laid out, but we certainly need to see it all, and we won't without the action of our bold president, and that's why we're here. And I'd like to introduce my colleague from the Judiciary Committee, Andy Dix. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, thanks Lee, and thank you to all who are uh, supporting this effort, because this is a really a, uh, a very top-line important issue. We have to get to these documents. We need to be able to see the FISA application. The, we've been uh, shut out on that. We need the 302s. We've been shut out on that. We need the assistance of the president because we're not getting assistance from the DOJ and the FBI. Now, I, I, I just want to divert for one quick second. As we've gone through this uh, and been interviewing people, both closed door and, and you've seen some of them openly, uh, I've been struck, um, and no pun intended, but I've been struck mm -hmm. and related to some of my colleagues that it is beyond me that we can find this this thread. You have, as, as Matt just said, you had the functional handle, the, the de facto handler of Christopher Steele, uh, the go-between with the FBI. His wife is actually working in the same organization to basically dispirit and defame a, a, a presidential candidate from the opposition party. We have everything that we learned about Peter Strzok, Lisa Page, in those highest levels, Andy McCabe, those who have left and those who were forced out. As we've interviewed them, I've been consciously struck that they haven't felt remorse for any of this conduct. They, they haven't seen any uh, deviation from what they might think is normal practice. That is why we have to get to the bottom of this, because as we go through this, if these folks continue to display a lack of conscience or remorse, it indicates that we might have a bigger problem than we even perceive today. And so I call upon the president with my colleagues to declassify this information so we might continue to find out how deep and how broad this goes. Thank you. 
And now I'll introduce my colleague, Keith Roffis. Thank you, Andy. Keith Roffis, Pennsylvania 12. You know, the American people believe in fairness. And we have institutions in our government, including the private court, where you need to have fairness. And there needs to be disclosure. And so in the interest of fairness for the American people, they deserve to know what was going on. The American people also deserve to be, to not have to put up with the endless spin from one side or the other. And the dis disclosure of this information without disclosing sources and methods gives them a chance. So in the name of fairness, we're asking the president to have these declassified. Thank you. Uh, we we, uh, we do, they, they did call votes about 15 minutes ago, so before, uh, but we're doing okay right now on time, but I just wanted to make sure any members of the press have any questions? Okay, so we're gonna get to a couple questions and then um, we do have a couple more members who wanna speak. Uh, Catherine here, Fox News. Does the president support the declassification of the documents and if so, then who or what is the block? Uh, we would have to defer to the White House to answer that question with regard to the president. <coughs> Um, we would like the president to declassify and release all this information we called on, but we don't. We can't speak for him as far as what he wants. Can I just clarify just one thing that someone said? Um, is it accurate that uh, McCabe, Strzok, Page, and the Justice Department's Andrew Weissman knew about uh, Orr's White's work as well as uh, Steele's animus towards the president before the FISA application? I believe all that's accurate. I can go back into the transcript. We, we, I, another thing I would love to see is uh, the transcript made public from the, I think, approximately seven hours that uh, Mr. Orr was in the, uh, in the transcribed interview. But I believe everything you cited there is accurate. Okay. Uh, thanks. Um, according to the uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, I think it was a letter that Senator Graham sent, uh, Bruce Orr met with the FBI uh, about the, the dossier for the first time in late November, which is a month after the first FISA application on Carter Page. So I'm just wondering how you see this um, this role influencing the FISA. Was it a, was it a renewal with the Carter Page application? Was there another another meeting that he had before uh, October? Well, we can't speak for the the contents of the 302s. Uh, there are 12 of them, uh, but that is one of the reasons why we're here is to be able to speak to you about the contents of the 302s. So one of the points that was made earlier by Congressman Gates as it relates to the FISA applications is that something that uh, he would expect, and I, I agree with him, uh, of what the contents of the FISA applications would show would be based on the omissions of what you don't see in it. However, the two other reasons why we're here, the 302s of Bruce Orr, uh, as well as some of the documents that have been provided to the Gang of Eight that has exculpatory evidence with regards to Carter Page and others, that that would include information that should have been presented to the FISA court and wasn't. Uh, but to answer your question, that's really one of the, re the reasons why we're here is because we want all 12 of those 302s to be released uh, to help answer that for you. But, but if I could understand the pattern, every single time Bruce Orr had a meeting, contact, phone call, Skype, whatever, with Mr. Steele or Mr. Simpson, he then followed up with a briefing with the Justice, FBI and Justice Department every single time. And we know he had a whole slew of these, because some of the stuff has been released, specifically the emails and text messages between Mr. Orr, <coughs> Mr. Simpson, and Mr. Steele. Oftentimes within hours. So to be clear, that was before the FISA application? Yes. Okay. Uh, Mr. Meadows, we just heard your colleague say they cannot speak for the president if he supports releasing this, but have you met with or spoke to the president about releasing this application? <laughs> well, uh, obviously, I've met with the president on other items. I don't normally comment on my conversations with the president. Uh, I can say that in my conversations with the president and the administration, uh, he has been very consistent on wanting transparency, and I have not seen a major pushback uh, on this request uh, as long as it protects sources and methods. And so uh, uh, I think for the vast majority of Americans, they would see it as a welcomed uh, response from this president. And uh, I, I, I've not gotten any indication of a pushback, uh, but as, as you know, I don't comment on my conversations with the president. I will say that this particular issue, and Lee and Jim and Matt have pointed this out, the information was collected in an abnormal way. It was verified in an abnormal way. And it was prosecuted in an abnormal way. 
you can't have all of that and end up with a process uh, that actually is a is representative of doing business uh, with Lady Justice having a blindfold. And, and so it was the improper collection, authentication, and prosecution <coughs> that we have run across in unclassified documents that we believe that the classified documents will further eliminate. Can I add one thing to that though? It's not just all those improprieties, it's the fact that the FISA courts have not protected the integrity of the courts. And we know that because there has been no one held to account for the improprieties by the Justice Department in coming in and getting not one, not two, not three, but four FISA warrants without providing the court proper information. And if the judges were doing their proper job and were not so chummy with the people that came before them, then they would have already had hearings uh, in contempt of court for what they had done abusing the FISA system. And when we had the testimony by Mr. Rosenstein, and I repeatedly asked him, did you read the application you signed? And he continued to refuse to indicate he even read that. The judge should have had him in court the next day demanding to know what the heck was going on and why he should not be in contempt of court for certifying something he didn't even bother to read. All of those things contribute to why we now have to ask the president, please declassify. The courts are not doing their job. The justice has had injustice throughout the top of it, and this is the way we get to justice. Thank you. Thank you. Just on a related issue, could you guys give us an update of um, document collection with DOJ and whether and the status of the impeachment um, or contempt resolutions that you all discussed before the meeting? We were able to get a number of documents. I've had conversations with the Deputy Attorney General last week. We were able to get a number of documents that we're actually currently reviewing to go through our checklist to see if we've got those. Uh, I can tell you that the response uh, has, has been uh, uh, very voluminous in the last week or so. Uh, and so we're, we're right now, our staff is going through to see if there's anything remaining. So. We should know in the next 24 hours or so whether there's still outstanding document requests as it relates to that particular effort, whether it be impeachment or contempt. As you know, uh, the speaker and, and uh, the chairman agreed that if, if they weren't responsive, they would look at a contempt uh, resolution in judiciary, and it is too early to tell, but that's where we are. Uh, I was hoping to get your thoughts on the New York Times op-ed. Uh, what do you think, uh, do you think the White House is gonna find the author I don't believe that that person is doing a good service to faithfully execute their job and performance of their duties, uh, whether it's to the president, to the White House, or to the American people. And that that person should not be inside of the administration and they should submit their letter of, rec of resignation uh, and move on to something else. If they wanna go join the resistance, uh, if they want to fight President Trump, uh, they should, do not, should not do it from a position where it is very important uh, for us to have the best people possible to protect American national security, uh, to make sure that our military is set up for success, to ensure that our veterans are taken care of when they come home, to grow our economy. Uh, when you appoint people to important positions within the government, you rely on them to do their jobs exceptionally. And that person, was, even though they said anonymous, they are outing themselves as someone who is not serving uh, the American people in the performance of the duties that they were appointed for. I, I believe that, I don't know who the person is, I don't know what job uh, title that they're currently filling, uh, and I, and I, I think, think that the more- I think called spy. And I think that more that we, the more that we learn about it, the more we'd be able to uh, answer that question as informed as possible. I'm right behind you. Uh, Congressman Meadows, did you say that you were investigating the op-ed or the, the person behind uh, that anonymous uh, writing? And how, how would you do that? <laughs> Unleash the power of the media. You guys are able to find out things that, uh, quite frankly, most people can't find. Uh, I, I can tell you that 
we're taking this very serious from a, as Lee would say, from a national security standpoint, and that's really my focus. And <coughs> everybody's entitled to free speech. Uh, that free speech is something that should be protected and guarded, and you'll find that I'll be a sentinel for doing exactly that. And yet at the same time, if, if you're having highly uh, sensitive and classified meetings within the Oval Office and you have someone trying to resist those efforts, um, you know, I think all of us would agree that it is highly unusual and perhaps the only time that it has ever happened that a, an anonymous source has posted an, an op-ed being part of an administration. I don't recall it. Uh, perhaps uh, some historians can correct it. So, so we're looking at what is proper if from a legislative branch standpoint. We have uh, oversight over the executive office of the president and, and uh, federal employees in, in oversight and government reform <coughs> under my subcommittee. And so as we look at that, uh, uh, we're, we're working very diligently. I think it puts the New York Times in a very difficult spot because uh, you have one part of the New York Times who's keeping uh, that source close. You got another part of the New York Times that uh, would have to do their investigative techniques for a Pulitzer Prize winning uh, uh, story and, and do that. So hopefully, uh, listen, nothing in this town stays secret forever. And so I do believe ultimately we will find out who uh, uh, was the author and, and we're looking at what is the proper role for our branch uh, and yet uh, to not overstep that uh, when it comes to the national security concerns. The bottom line, no concrete, no concrete steps. Right. right, there's no concrete steps. Uh, two quick uh, questions, last questions, and we're gonna have to have the vote. Um, will you recall uh, to testify the former FBI director or his deputy to determine who signed off in the back channel communications between or steel and Fusion GPS? Oh, the, we have some members of our uh, judiciary committee and oversight government reform. So. Well, well, look, I'm hoping we get uh, Nellie Orr in for a transcribed interview, ASAP, and, and Glenn Simpson as well. Um, I do think, based on what we learned from Mr. Orr, that Andy McCabe was in, in on this from the get-go, because we know that shortly after the first meeting that um, Mr. Orr and his wife had with Chris Steele, he went straight to Andy McCabe. So certainly McCabe seems like someone who should be brought back in, but I'm more focused right now on Nellie Orr and what about Director Comey? Yeah, we'll leave that up to you, Mr. Uh, Chairman Dowdy. Ms. Chairman, good job. Last question. Uh, I have a follow-up for Mr. Meadows. You said we. I just wanted to clarify, is that your subcommittee or a different group? And also, Speaker Ryan today said he didn't see a role for Congress. So I'm curious if any of you are following up with Mr. Meadows looking at legislative solutions. Well, I, I guess this is a news-breaking day. I have a different opinion than the speaker. I, that has never, ever happened. Uh, yeah. Listen, I, I, again, we're in the early stages of this. You, I, I spoke to you earlier on this. I, I think what uh, I normally use the vernacular we, meaning the legislative body. Uh, uh, you know, I, I probably am a, a little bit uh, more uniquely tuned into this just because of my subcommittee work with the federal workforce and the uh, oversight of the executive branch. And, and yet, um, you know, it may be something that fundamentally is only the role of the Department of Justice and uh, the executive <coughs> branch. And so, you know, we're, we're less than 24 hours into this. Uh, I don't want to jump to any conclusions. Do I take it seriously? Mm -hmm. Certainly. Uh, should we all take it seriously? Without a doubt. And. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to come up with some kind of concrete steps, you know, in, in, in the days to come. I just ask one more question quickly. Yep, we have oh. to go vote. Okay, uh, about um, to this. just one more question. I just to prepare for today, I went back to the June testimony of the Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein, and in that testimony he seemed to indicate that he has been relieved of his responsibility to sign the FISA applications. Was that anyone's understanding? I think he did it himself. I remember. If I remember, I have to look, but I think he made that decision on his own. Can you come just come to the podium because... Uh, I think you're right. I have to go back and look at it as well, but I remember in that testimony, I think he made that decision himself to kind of recuse himself from signing. Um, was that that, that was my understanding, I, but I have to go back and look at it. To see was that in light of the IG investigation? I got to go back and look at the thing. Okay, thank you. Thank you all for attending. I want to thank my colleagues for their... Uh, their